Well, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Welcome to this uh, next session on EM Mission Innovation and Technology. My name is Rod Romando, Senior Technical Advisor in uh, EM, and I'll be moderating this session. Um, before we get started, I'd like to set the stage and help place this session into context. Um, I hope to explain to you why, from a technology standpoint, we're at a critical juncture in our cleanup mission. Uh, since our nuclear cleanup mission was chartered in 1989, and, and this is a, a graph that most of you are familiar with, we've made tremendous progress uh, completing our mission at uh, 91 of the original 107 major sites, as indicated by the blue dots and the states uh, represented in green. We have much work ahead of us. Uh, the work represents some of the most challenging cleanup work in the world, and as shown on the map, we're now focused on the remaining 16 sites as identified by the stars in the states uh, that are highlighted in red. Uh, in terms of our success, the, the graph shows the profile of EM's annual budget from 1989 to 2014, during which the U.S. government invested over $150 billion in our cleanup mission. Uh, during that 25-year period, our average annual budget was about uh, $6 billion, as indicated by the dashed line. This graph shows the annual profile of our cost for measure the, for the re remaining work as scheduled to meet our regulatory and uh, legal uh, commitments. Our to-go scope is estimated to cost over $235 billion and take another 50 years to complete. On that graph, I superimpose the $6 billion budget line as a benchmark. What stands out immediately is that from now to about 2040, there's a challenge of about $28 billion. Uh, what's not shown on that graph, obviously, is the type of work that needs to get done. Much of that work during that period is in our high-level waste program, which has a lot of technical uncertainty and a technical risk. In order to close that gap, we believe the, uh, the strategic infusion of, of smart science, imaginative engineering, novel technologies, and innovative solutions will play a big role. For a moment, let's take a look at our historical investment in technologies. This graph shows the percentage of funding that was specifically designated for technology development compared to our annual budgets. The profile is divided into three distinct periods, uh, the first of which is the period from the beginning, 1989, to about 2002, during which we invested on average about 5.49% uh, of our annual budget on technologies. Keep in mind that this was the very early years of the program uh, where the emphasis was on soil and groundwater remediation. Uh, particularly those waste units where there was an immediate or significant threat of a release to the environment. I designated this period as that of a source control and containment. A sizable investment in technologies was needed during this period because, as most of you know, remedial technologies were not readily available and certainly none that could address the radioactive contamination that we have. The second period from 2003 to 2010 shows a sharp decrease in our technology funding. Only 0.66% of that, of, uh, on average, of our annual budget was allocated towards technologies. Uh, why? Well, during this period, as, as most of you know, we shifted to a mode of accelerated site closure in, a, in an effort to make demonstrable progress um, in our cleanup mission. Uh, I argue that because of the investment in technologies that we made during the first 15 years of our program, uh, remedial solutions were readily available to us to allow us to achieve closure at sites like Rocky Flats in Colorado and Fernamal Mound and Ashtabula in Ohio. Because of our uh, technical capability, uh, fruits were actually made to be uh, low hanging. This brings us to our current period. Since 2011, our, an our average investment at technology is about 0.23% of our annual budgets. Given the technical challenges we face now, we're handicapped in our ability to respond with advanced technologies and innovative solutions. In some respects, we've lost our, our technical edge. So how do we overcome this challenge? How do we enable innovation, ingenuity, and take advantage of the state of the art or, as needed, help to advance the state of the art? What is the next big step increase? To share their perspectives, we have a, a, a panel of four distinguished panelists many of whom you already know. Gerald Boyd 
will be leading off. He's the vice president of Stoller Newport News Nuclear, and he was a member of the CEB Task Force on EM Technology Development. Uh, Gerald will share his perspectives as a member of the Secretary's Task Force. Uh, Mark Gilbertson is EM's Deputy Assistant Se uh, Secretary for Site Restoration. Mark will be talking from a corporate headquarters perspective. Uh, Dr. Terry Mikowski is the director of Savannah River National Laboratory. His viewpoints will be from that of EM's corporate lab. And then uh, batting cleanup, Kevin Smith is the manager of EM's Office of River Protection at Hanford. Uh, Kevin will give his perspectives uh, from the field and in particular highlight an initiative he has taken over the last few years to help address his, actually our, uh, technical challenge uh, with the Hanford waste. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gerald. Is, is that clock going to run down there? <laughs> yeah. I think it's <laughs> well, uh, thank you, and, and uh, thank you all for being here today. I hope that what we're about to do will be of some help. Those of you that have been around this business for uh, some time looking at technology, you know we have studied this a lot. Uh, there have been many, many debates and discussions about how much of an investment is the right investment. And this task force took another look at that. Uh, this past year, and I want to spend just a very few minutes kind of giving you the highlights of that. I've got two or three slides in here that Rod's already showed you, so I'll try to skip through those. Um, but <clears throat> where do you point this thing to make it work? Do you know? Technology. Technology. There we go. I think the secretary this morning pretty well described why he was doing this, and it had to do with those charts that uh, Rod just showed you a few minutes ago. The cost is so massive going forward, uh, and the amount of investment that we've had in technology has been, limit, been limited over the last number of years. But he asked us to look at opportunities and barriers for science and technologies, look at a means to implement a program, and then to address the issue of funding. So those were the three things that the Secretary wanted the task force to look at, and that's what we spent our, uh, our effort and our time doing. Just so you'll know, the, chair, the uh, task force was chaired by uh, Dick Meserve, uh, who is uh, President Emeritus of the Carnegie Institute, uh, Raphael Bras from Georgia Institute of Technology, Tom Hunter, who used to be with Sandia La National Laboratories, Deborah Jen, who is with NIST, Dave Cosson, who is with Vanderbilt, and Dave Maloney, who is Emeritus Technology Fellow at CH2M Hill. So uh, that's the group that uh, wound up publishing this particular report for the Secretary. So the timeline that we were on, he tasked us in May of 2014. We held two public meetings to get input from the public. Uh, and, and of course, that public was an interested public, not just people who walked off the street, but people that knew the sites, knew the issues that came in and spoke and gave us input as to what uh, the public thought we should do. We did two of those, one in uh, July, one in October. We published a, issued a report uh, in December to the secretary, and then it got released to the public in 2015. Uh, the department then took that report that was issued to the secretary through the CAB, uh, and they did a response, and I think folks up here on this, this uh, dais has uh, had a lot to do with what that response was. And so what I want to do is tell you what we put in our recommendations and then tell you what the DOE's response to that was. And then as you hear Mark talk and Kevin talk and Terry talk, you'll hear some of the things that are going on that address some of the issues that are in this uh, CEB uh, recommendation report. Uh, you've already seen this. Uh, I think the only thing I'd point out on this chart is if that red line is reality, and it seems to be, that means it is a very long time before this is going to get finished, and there is a lot of opportunity time to build a good R&D program that is cost effective and valuable in helping reduce that cost and make this happen at a better time. We know that we have been through periods where we had, we had five-year plans, 10-year plans, 30-year plans, and as a result of those plans, we thought we were going to close a lot of things, and we did close a lot of things, but a lot of things have been left, and the result is that the investment in the R&D program has gone down. 
And so you have to ask yourself the question, is there a sufficient time, is, is the duration of this sufficient that you can build, rebuild uh, an R&D program? And we think that chart right there says, yes, there is. And you can see where the investment has gone. Uh, it averaged about 5 to 6% for the longest time. I'll tell you in a minute what we're recommending on the, on the CAB as to what that ought to be. Now, you heard the Secretary say this morning when he was up here that he's not sure that we can afford what we recommended. And we felt like we were being fairly conservative because on the, on the task force, there was a very wide range of what we thought the investment ought to be, and we sort of brought it to, uh, to the middle. So we put forward a fairly conservative uh, recommendation, we think, in terms of funding but even with that conservative estimate and all of the compliance agreements that we have uh, to deal with across the complex question is how we're going to be able to afford that. So <clears throat> what, we, uh, what we did, we looked at two things. One, you can't really just look at technology by itself. You've got to look at, at, at management improvement. And so we looked at management improvement and we looked at a technology portfolio. The management improvement naturally addressed those kinds of things like improving the systems approach and aligning uh, the cleanup program with the regulatory framework. I think we all know that those two things are a bit disconnected because the compliance agreements are such that we don't really have adequate funding to do everything that needs to be done. And there probably, from a management perspective, needs to be some realignment of that. <clears throat> From a technology portfolio, we're recommending a 3% investment, uh, the, the task force did. Uh, so if you take a 5 to $6 billion annual budget, that would be somewhere between $150 and $180 million a year invested in science and technology uh, to try to address the challenge that we see in front of us. So we broke that down into three technology and science areas. Uh, the first is incremental technologies, which you can see we recommended 30 to 50 million. High impact technologies, 75 to 100, but starting low in that particular area. And third is fundamental research, about $25 million a year. The fourth thing we recommended, which is not really the R&D program, but really supports it, is a strong um, EM University collaboration program with some investment uh, the Office of Nuclear Energy does that today, and we believe that we should see uh, EM do that as well. So just very quickly, um, what do we mean by incremental technologies? So incremental technologies are designed to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the current process. Whatever the current process is being used to treat high-level waste, to treat groundwater problems, to do D&D, whatever process we're using, how do we improve the technologies within that existing uh, approach? And quite frankly, if you look back in history, you can see that you can get a lot of gains out of incremental improvements because it, it, it's happened in many places. Rocky Flats is a good example of it. Uh, when Rocky Flats came in uh, ahead of schedule, they saved a lot of money, reinvested it, and the way that was done was to improve incrementally technologies that they were using. Um, and, and, and what they, they looked at, you know, chemical decon processes, they looked at different kind of uh, detection mechanisms, they looked at different ways of packaging and shipping waste. So they did a lot of incremental improvements and the result was, I think, a very good, uh, very good product. And how did we do that? Um, so the technology program co-funded with the project, with the Rocky Flats project, the contractor co-funded those things. So there was a, an investment by the contractor. There was an incentive for the contractor to, um, to, to do this. The second um, thing is high impact technologies, and these are things that are outside the day-to-day -day norm. Things that are game changing, things that are breakthrough uh, in, in, in um, uh, and trying to get the, the job done. For example, um, improved glass waste loading, for example, is, is a game-changing high-impact technology that we worked on for, for a number of years. Engineered groundwater remediation techniques, next-generation solvents for cesium removal. Those are the kinds of high-impact, game-changing 
uh, breakthrough technology that we think there needs to be an investment for. And then the third is just fundamental research, and that is knowledge-based understanding processes, and that fundamental research, that improvement in knowledge and understanding of processes can help all of these, not, you know, not just a, a, the high impact. We believe, and we recommend it in the, in the report, that number one, number two ought to be managed by EM, and number three ought to be managed by the Office of Science. Terry, did I get that right? Uh, and then the fourth is the EM University collaboration, and that's engaging the university system uh, and postdocs and making sure that there's a workforce coming along later that can help, uh, help do all of these. So what did the department think about what we suggested? They did respond in May back to the task force uh, in writing with a report. And overall, DOE agreed with the recommendations and suggestions. Overall, they thought the portfolio structure that we recommended, those three areas of research and development, they agreed with that. They thought that was a good way to do it. In terms of funding levels, I think that's still up for debate. I think that you heard the Secretary say it this morning, it is a challenge to do it. Um, and it's got to be commensurate with technical uncertainties and risk. You can't just start throwing money from a technology perspective at a particular problem unless you understand the uncertainties in that project and what the risks are in that project. And there needs to be a gradual ramp up. Uh, that was what the department said back to us was, you know, we can't just do this overnight. The, the CAB did not, the task force did not recommend asking for new money. Uh, we believe that over some short period of time, we can figure out how to save enough money by applying new technologies that we should be funding this within our, our cu current um, budget levels. It would always be great to be able to have an adder if Congress would agree with that, if the administration would agree with that, but we didn't feel like that that was probably likely, and therefore we recommended that some way or another we find the funding uh, within the budgets. So in final closing thoughts, uh, the mission success that, that, that Rod showed you a few minutes ago, reducing the number of sites down to 16 from a 109, I guess it was, um, that that has been a great success. But what is left is 50 more years at best and $250 billion at best and could be a lot more than that. So we believe there's a lot of opportunity to improve worker safety and facility safety through new technologies, environmental and public protection. We can reduce the federal liability dramatically, we believe, uh, and it would require collaboration with technologists and scientists both inside and outside the EM program, inside and outside the Department of Energy, and we need an investment in the next generation workforce. So that, in a nutshell, is what our report uh, recommended to the department. The department, I think, agreed with most of our recommendations. Uh, it, there's a question about whether or not we can afford to fund it at the levels that we recommended but we still think those are good targets if we can figure out how to do that. So thank you for your time. I want to thank Gerald. I, you know, we were kind of comparing notes before um, the session started and I said, you know, this is a lot like that movie Groundhog Day. And if, for those of you who may not know, in the, uh, I worked with Gerald since the Tom Grumbly days in trying to get the technology and science program up off of the ground and, and get it running in the right kind of way. And his task force and the secretary's efforts and Monica's efforts, you know, have really given us that reset button, like in Groundhog Day, to go back and really examine um, what the nature of the program is and where we need to go in the future. Let's see, how did that... Down there somewhere? Huh. I see that. Um, so. The unique thing about it, what's important and why, why we're excited about giving this, this talk here today to you is because we need all of you 
as a part of that change. It's about a change in culture in EM as we kind of move forward in this program to take advantage of what the secretarial initiative, the CEAB report kind of came in to realign and restructure our program to guide our actions going into the future. The, I'll kind of give you a preview of where we're going in fiscal year 16 with regard to the budget and how we're going to align some things to keep in, in concert with this vision going forward, but we all need to share going into the future so that we can build that kind of budget space in 17 and 18 necessary to continue those kind of efforts. Uh, so what do we do? We restructured the EM program. The $15 million that was talked about with regard to the technology program, uh, we structured it. We, we put in place a new strategy where you know, we focused on opportunities to move forward, opportunities where we could make a difference in, in the program. And then we look to our existing programs to realign them for the synergy to move in the directions that the group talked about. So you saw what Gerald provided with regard to recommendations. And we have basically essentially adopted that framework as we move forward with the program. So what are we focusing on in the technology development program? So these are the things, the, the re formulation of the program overall that we're working with the Savannah River National Lab on and restructuring things and other national labs as partners to focus on opportunities. So what do we have here if you look at this list? Well, we have a technology pull kind of effort. You heard Monica talk about the opportunity to partner with any on borehole kind of activities to look at different ways to dispose of materials. Uh, you heard the discussions about robotics and our opportunities that we have potentially to pull the, the technologies that are being developed not only here in this country for other purposes, but ones that are being used in the UK and being developed in Japan to help us with our efforts overall. The next kind of category of work that we have is, is so we have technology enablers, enablers, innovation enablers. And so what is that? So that's the test bed kind of concept of where we can go forward and try and, and test technologies and get them mature because you heard the speakers a little bit earlier today. So we want the technology available so when we need it, we can use it a day later. And then the last kind of, of area that we, we concentrated on, which are things like the mercury and technetium. You heard Ten Ken talk about Y12 and the mercury treatment system there and the land disposal facility. But another thing we need to tackle is, is mercury and the environment in that area, how we deal with, with the mercury and the environment. We also need to tackle the issue of mercury impregnated building materials and what are the best place, uh, ways to treat those materials when we have a problem with mercury, what's the best way to stabilize it from a cost perspective. So that's the kind of things that we, we drove to. Um, and so the first one is tied to the cesium and strontium overall. You heard a little bit about the capsules um, today up in the WESF area at Hanford's. And so you have that as one option tied to um, boreholes and potentially putting the materials in a, de in a demonstration. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could take non eludable resins and load them up and dispose of them too, perhaps for technetium um, as we move forward with it, or for cesium and strontium, those kind of things. Um, and so that would help with the Hanford and with the Savannah River kind of activities. And wouldn't it be nice if we could essentially disposition the calcine, which is safe in the bins right now, but disposition it potentially in a borehole or another uh, geologic repository. So those are the kind of things where we're looking to leverage what investments the rest of the department is doing with our investments to move those forward. We talked a little bit, I talked a little bit about the mercury. So the next step beyond ETTP is Y12 and Ornell. And so these are things right now, when I talk about an opportunity-driven program, as we move beyond the 2015 time frame, and you heard Ken talk about the 15 to 20 time frame and beyond it, as we get to Y12, 
you know, these are the issues that we need to have talked about and need to have solved as we move forward with the program. What do we do with that mercury? And for anybody that has been following the excess facilities issues in the department over the last year's period of time, we got a couple of GAO reports, we got an IG report, um, you know, NNSA has a, a several facilities, the high-profile facilities at Y12 that they want us to take. And all of this work is precursor work that allows us to do that. And by the way, there's one thing and reason why we need all of your help, because it's important at Oak Ridge that we keep that workforce moving forward, a trained workforce working on the D&D kind of activities there. And one of the reasons we need your help is, is so there's a little thing. Ken talked about the importance of that UED&D fund that he's going to stop using so Murphy can use it at Portsmouth and Paducah. Well, you know, for Y12, you can't use that UED&D fund. That's defense funding that needs to be used to do that kind of cleanup. So we need to be mindful that we need a ramp up in defense funding to take advantage of successfully completing ETTP and move forward with the, the uh, completion of the Oak Ridge work. <coughs> oh, too far. Oh, there we go. So one of our, our problem areas that, you know, when I first talked to the Office of Science folks, you know, I said, technetium, why, why is that a problem for you? Well, that's why partnering is, is so important, um, because they were very conscious about when we partnered with them a decade ago and about the plutonium kind of work that they helped us with, but weren't as cognizant about the Tech 99 work. And so the work with the Savannah River National Laboratory and PNNL National Laboratory has demonstrated that, you know, technetium is a lot more complex than originally thought of. And not all, all technetium, the forms and species of technetium, have the same mobility. So in a lot of cases, we're doing cleanups that are driven by the most mobile forms of technetium. So we need to look at it in a more refined kind of manner as we move forward. Because for people that are involved with the performance assessment activities at our sites, for the closure of tanks and for the monitoring of the performance of landfills, know that one of our problem characters is technetium. It's the most mobile material along with iodine that we have, and it drives the performance of our, our disposal facilities. So this is one of the challenges we're talking, want to talk about. <clears throat> Again, um, test beds, you know, as, as um, Rod has talked about a number of times, and, and he's a, a lead on this with the National Laboratory, you know, it's like the issue is, is, is so is, there's got to be places to take good ideas and concepts and demonstrate them in a rad environment so that we can make them ready uh, for use um, on the sites overall. And so that's what this, this effort is about. Um, robotics, <clears throat> you know, the robotics kind of initiative we talked about, it is trying to leverage the existing kind of knowledge that's out there, the explosion in activities, but areas that we can use in Monica mentioned black cells and using them to make it gray cells, using it at WIP overall. Another potential candidate at Hanford is, is for people that are familiar, the Purex tunnels, going in and characterizing those or potentially remedying them. We are doing work right now. You heard the discussions about the contamination under 324 and examining the design of robotic kind of methods to remove that contamination under 324. The next thing that we're trying to align overall with regard to our work is, is, is all the rest of the programs that we've had in, uh, in, in place in the department we're trying to align towards these principles that came out, came through the CEAP program. So we have an international program that we're, we're driving forward with where we're really trying to learn from the UK and partnering with Canada and Japan to share some of our lessons learned. The next thing for future generations, if we, we've established at the Secretary's direction a traineeship program. This first program, which has competitively been let, and we'll make an announcement this fall of what university or universities will have selected, is going to be focused on robotics. But in the future, we're partnering with any 
uh, to look at um, in the area of actinide chemistry. The other thing that we're trying to leverage is our national laboratory um, manages for us our minor minority serving institution programs. So we're trying to leverage that so that the next generation of people that work on EM cleanup projects looks like the rest of EM. So it's a, a pretty important thing. We've got an $8 million a year program um, that we have the lab managed that we can leverage to do that. In addition, we have several existing institutions that we're trying to realign to focus on our, our activities. I won't go through this, but this is the, the hub issue. This is the Office of Science, had a workshop this last summer. These are some of the research areas that the Office of Science is considering for their science hub as they move forward with the program. And for people that are involved in the business, you'll recognize these are things that we'd like to tackle to have greater, um, reduce the uncertainty associated with the program. And this is just our closing thoughts, you know, um, overall. Um, we think this is a real opportunity, you know, that reset button for Groundhog Day, um, where we can get it right this time. But we need all of your help as we move forward with this. Uh, to build the support, to come up with the ideas, the innovation necessary, to look to opportunities to build it into programs, to be willing to raise your hand and say, you know, there's this on-ramp here that if you develop this, we could use it as a part of our program and it'd really make a difference. So, thank you. Okay, I've seen three people do this, so I'm, <laughs> but I don't even have slides to start with, so maybe I don't need to do this, so there we go. Uh, I wanted to start out just by saying a little bit about innovation. You know, we're talking about innovation for the success of the mission here, and if you look up a definition, you know, innovation is that process that transfers ideas into products and services that add value. That's what innovation is. So if I have a really great idea, guess what? That's not innovation. It's not innovation until I do something with it. It's not innovation until it makes a difference. And what I want to say here is that you don't make a difference without having teams. You need that science. You definitely need to understand the basis for that idea. There are a lot of ideas that sound great, but they actually don't work because they're not grounded in science. You need to take that idea and convert it into a technology that can be trusted. You have to go through the stage of maturing that technology to a point where you know you can actually use it. And then guess what? You've got to use it. You've got to develop the operational protocols and procedures that allow you to take advantage of that. So anything we ever point to that's a success in EM innovation has taken teams that go across that whole spectrum, and it will going forward. So there's, there's really four points that, that I want to try and make here. One is that we have proof that innovation can add value to the EM mission. Now, I'll certainly happy to take the uh, secretary's number of $10 billion. That's, that's a nice number. But I want to say that we have the data that shows those are all real and they all took these teams to be successful. The second point is that there's plenty of opportunity left to innovate. And we've heard it said here a number of times that we've got a ways to go on this program. We have lots of opportunity to find new and better ways to do things. We're going to have to find better ways to do things. My third point is that we have the luxury of drawing upon ideas from lots of different fields. There are tremendous explosions of new ideas in manu advanced manufacturing and chemical processing, uh, in areas of working in high hazard environments. This is, there is so much happening out there that we have this enormous sort of uh, a wealth of ideas but those ideas can't just be brought into our world. We're going to have to 
invest in adapting them to the kinds of problems, the kinds of conditions that we have to work with. And then I think my final, my fourth point is that innovation has, it must be consistently applied. You can't go, oh my goodness, everything, the wheels are coming off, it's time to innovate. It doesn't work that way. In fact, you have to innovate when it's going very well. Because you understand enough in that point to actually do it better. In some ways, it's harder to innovate when it's all, when the wheels are off, because you don't know where to start. So um, I have four slides that make those points. And I can't walk away without pictures, and I've, I've got time, so. Um, and I'm failing at this first thing. So, uh, yeah, we have great examples of innovation. Um, you know, we were able on the Savannah Riverside to close, uh, decommission the PNR reactors uh, by an in-situ decommissioning approach. It had never been done before, never anywhere in the world. That saved about $300 million. And actually, you know what? It's done. That's the best part. It's absolutely done. Uh, uh, Gerald mentioned glass loading. Um, a th working together between the university, the lab, and, and, and the contractor, we've increased the glass loading by 30%. You know what that is? That's 1,400 glass logs that will never be made. They will never be stored. They will never be transported. And by the way, each one costs about a million bucks to make, so that's $1.4 billion to boot. So we know that innovation can deliver value, no question about it. We also know that there's plenty of room to go. And, and, and obviously, one of our biggest challenges is in the, in the high-level waste and legacy materials. And here we have opportunities to really you know, reduce capital and life cycle costs, to decrease the plant footprint, which makes it cheaper to decommission when you're done. We have opportunities to reduce the risk, the hazard of the operation. These are things that will contribute to success. Obviously, in, in soil and groundwater, we've got to do things that reduce worker exposure, that minimize secondary waste streams. I mean, in some cases, we clean one thing up and we create another waste stream. We can, we can innovate our way around that. Uh, we need to improve the operation of these long-term facilities. Some will be in place for, for decades. These are the topics we're trying to innovate around, not some technology idea. This is the, this is the, 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 the message here. And, and of course, we're gonna finish cleaning all of these 16 sites. I thought there were 17, I guess I... <laughs> One must have got cleaned up last weekend. <laughs> okay. But you know, we're going to have to assess how well we did. This is going to be an enormous job for the, for the government to assure that what we did is effective and that the effectiveness is still in place. And there are a lot of opportunities. That, that's going to be a very expensive thing to do. A lot of opportunities to do that in different ways using uh, you know, intelligence, robotics, uh, various approaches, modeling that helps us know when it's in place, when it's not. So our opportunities are, are huge, and they cut across every part of the EM mission. And then finally, there is a tremendous, tremendously rich palette of colors to paint with here. And, and this is just some of the things that are going on in the industrial world. Uh, additive manufacturing. You know, we've had a good experience in doing our true waste. We used additive manufacturing to build tools for our workers to get the waste package. That's just the start. There's so much more we can do. I don't know why we can't actually make waste forms by printing them someday. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be cool? Sounds crazy, but it could work. Uh, virtual reality. You know, every, my, every kid that comes out of school now knows more about virtual reality than any of us do. 
But we're starting to use that to train our workers. So we're, we're going to be doing a major uh, decommissioning of, uh, of the uh, 235F facility at the Savannah River site. We have a digital construct of that facility now. And our workers can go in and train the tools, the approaches that they're going to see when they actually go in there. They can make mistakes in this environment and understand what that means. You can't make those mistakes in the real one. Uh, you know, smart manufacturing. This is really how do you put more intelligence into the manufacturing process. Um, we're working with the, uh, with the uh, Savannah River remediations right now on, on how can we apply this in the, in the VIT plant. Um, and the uh, investment we're making is some of our LDRD funds from the lab to look at how we can take process hold steps out by using models to predict the quality of the outcome. This has the potential to increase the throughput by 40% in the plant. This is why industry is doing this. This is, these things are being not just ideas in the academic community, this is, these are industrial concepts. But we have to work to make sure, do they, do they fit within the nuclear environment? Can we, can we get them so that they're, they're robust enough for that to happen? Uh, this is the work we have to do to make sure that they really can be transferred. But I'm telling you, the opportunities are just enormous. So um, I think, you know, it's important for this community to understand that, that you've been innovating, and those innovations have had huge impact on the, on the program. The world of innovation, in some ways, is exploding around us. We just have to grab more of it and put it into place here. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. The, uh, I think the title of the slide is, you know, it is almost should be, instead of technology development, it really should be uh, reestablishing creativity because we have, uh, for a long period of time, stopped creative thought or th stopped thinking about opportunities that we could do at sites because we had been set into a routine based on our, our, uh, our, our current scope, our current missions, our current contracts. And so uh, before I start, though, I want to dispel one rumor that uh, it wasn't because I failed a psych eval that I ended up going from Los Alamos to ORP. <laughs> okay. But ORP was a big challenge, and ORP really uh, required the first thing I thought of was when it given a, given a task the size of ORP is I've got to have a bigger team. I've got to have a, a outreach well beyond the boundaries of ORP. I've got to get people to help from all demand, demands, institutions, colleges, universities, national laboratories. I need everybody's help and ideas to figure out how to put the waste treatment plant back on the right path to success. And I also realized a long time ago, and it was reinforced when I was at Los Alamos, that what may not be possible yesterday might be possible today. And so if you don't continue to ask the creativity questions, you'll miss the big change that allows you to do something different or better. So having said that, for those that are not familiar with the Office of River Protection, uh, we, we have uh, the tank farm managed by Was Washington River Protection Solutions. Bechtel Construction is building the waste treatment plant. And we have an analytical laboratory contract that is uh, currently just about ready to transition to a, to a new company. It's overseen by our office, the Office for Protection that was carved out separate from the Hanford uh, Richland office. In the middle of that little donut is a thing that we put in place called One System to marry the two contracts to get, get together, to marry labor unions, to marry programs, to marry standards together. And that one's, that's the One System program, if you hear it. This is our mission and our vision. And I'll, for this particular discussion, if you look at the bottom of the vision statement, in order to achieve our mission with, with environmental and fiscal responsibility, I have to do something different and more effective. That means I can't always stand with the status quo to be able to get there. So we, we did a couple things. Well, first of all, in the center of the site, this is the Hanford site. The Columbia River is, uh, you can see the outline that winds through it. The little yellow area in the center is where the Office of River Protection lies. And if I take a picture of it toward uh, uh, Mount Rainier and Mount Adams in the background, there's the waste treatment plant in the bottom, the near tank farm, and the far of tame farm about seven miles away. So that gives you at least the landscape. So the challenges we have, 
Well, first of all, we have mission challenges. We have hazardous operations. They are typical of our business. And the bottom left-hand corner represents approximately 56 million gallons of leftover Cold War and uh, Manhattan Project um, nuclear waste of the various types of salt cake, supernate, and sludge. We also have technical challenges. We have uh, monitoring and activities in a nuclear tank farm that's a, a really a cocktail of various things over a number of different processes who were tried before they settled on Purex. We have scientific challenges and we have significant technical challenges. Well, what we ended up doing was we had to go back and reestablish the team. And this is the, this is the players that we have. And we had to also team out with industry. We had to first of all stop and get everybody on a common focus where we needed to go, be very communicative and very consistent. And this allowed us then to start thinking about and forecasting what did we really need to do to do our job. We had to be predictable as feds. We had to be consistent as well as fair in the way we related things and had to reward innovation and creativity and things that made a difference. In many cases, we had to change the performance evaluation plans to open the door for this kind of creativity. So changing the relationship, looking forward, uh, we basically questioned things. We started bringing in activities encouraging innovation, re revitalizing the technical things that are available today to manage a tank farm completely differently. These are the kinds of things that we're, brought, that we're currently bringing in to address the risks of vapors. We also reached out to universities and started to say, okay, we're on the, are we on the right path? What we found was something striking, and I'll articulate with a story with Jane Hedges, who is the, from Ecology in here. Uh, she and I were up, uh, and she was giving a presentation to the Bellevue Rotary uh, in Washington State. And at the end of the discussion, uh, there were two people who came up to me. The first one was really livid because I wouldn't give him a contract on the spot for using the trails of his, co of his cement company that, that, to, do, to put the nuclear waste in concrete instead of Jersey barriers at his, his normal offlet of concrete. And the second person was the, chair, was the former chair of the Rotary that says, gee, I didn't know anything about this nuclear waste stuff in my state. He'd lived there for 39 years. And it, it just was striking how few people really know everything that goes on. We assume in our communities they do. We assume the universities are telling their students. We assume the companies that are out there, they don't. We found that we had to go on a massive education program of to saying, what are our challenges and how can you tie in to us to do that? Then we went back and found that we were not using the national laboratories correctly. We were buying a scientist for a drink for a project instead of harnessing the capability of the national laboratory system. So we changed the way we outreached and worked with the national labs. We also brought in additional national laboratories that was, were there for, that may have more capabilities, different capabilities, but also competition is just good. So we created a process to put this together, and this is the reason I'm here today, is that we created a grand challenge workshop we're about three weeks away from our third one. The criteria to enter the workshop is to have an idea that saves $250 million or more. That's the threshold. We have 39 submissions this year. We have a grading panel that we uh, outreach uh, our technology folks, our uh, national laboratories, our uh, contractor leads in order to score these. And then we bring in the top 10 or 11 and let it be presented to uh, that group and scored in public. So these are the topical areas, and we found some unique things this year. First of all, the Nez Pierce tribe submitted a grand challenge idea. University of Washington, Washington State University, Florida International, and we had partnerships with the Pacific Northwest National Lab and Savannah River National Lab, partnerships with companies and entities to try to put together an idea that they thought could make a difference in it. We're down now to 10. But these are the way that they, it has split out and who nominated for this time. But what it has done is it has opened the door and remarried companies and universities and communities and national laboratories to the Office of River Protection Mission. It has acquainted them to the challenges. It has reopened the doors to let them predict what do we need now and in the next 10 or 20 years and what technologies, what, what skills can they develop in the national laboratories to really make a difference and insert into our program at the right point and the right time. So our grand challenges was a way to try to do this from the bottom up. And we now compete these, we share the packages, we go to the universities, we look for companies, we look for matches. Some things we just go say, go just go do.
because it, uh, it's, 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 it's a, just a common sense idea and we can save a lot of money by good doing. So the purpose of really is it reestablishing creativity, reestablishing innovation in the Office of River Protection Mission and allow us to do a better job more efficiently and more effectively. So this is our third Grand Challenge workshop. It's coming up in about three weeks. We've announced the top 10. Uh, we may, may have one right on the border of 11 because we had a four-way tie. But we're, we're, we have an opportunity to change our destiny, and even at the site level. And then I will tell you, it is actually, I'm pretty competitive when I finally take the winner of our program and compete for EM's dollars at headquarters, okay, with, with this kind of background. But it also means I get all kinds of things all year long from the universities. I get all things along for the people that are out there because we've now reacquainted the entire scientific and environmental management community to the needs of what we need at the Office of Urban Protection. So to conclude, this is really, uh, we're trying to create the future. We've seen that we need to do things more efficiently to be able to do it in the same amount of dollars. If you stand still, somebody's going to pass you. So we've challenged the folks that touch us to look at a way to be able to see that this is not just a slogan, it's an imperative. We have to do things more efficiently. I have to get breathing room on my budget. I have to get breathing room to get things done. So this gives you a, a snapshot of ORP. It gave you a snapshot of our Graham Challenge competition. And it gave you a, a way of how we think from a field office level how important creativity and innovation is to the success of, of our mission in the future. Thank you. All right, we've got some time, a few minutes for um, questions and answers. Oh. I guess there's a microphone, there we go, thank you. Yeah, uh, Kevin, this, and this may be a little bit out of context with just simply uh, technology and creativity innovation. Um, and I saw the way, um, and, and of course we work with you, you've harnessed and enabled uh, the different groups, the different contractors, the universities, the state, uh, and then enable them to work together through Grand Challenge and all that. Um, what else do you need to be successful out at Hanford in removing the risk? Grand challenge-wise, what I'd really like to do is be able to have funding that comes out of the bigger uh, technology development piece to reward the, the number one winners of these things so that we can develop them on the spot. Because as it stands today, I have to insert them into my program at some point in the future. So having headquarters sponsorship of these kinds of things and the winners at some point, or national laboratory sponsorship of these winners, uh, working through the intellectual property rights and so forth. What I need overall is consistency and just uh, the right people with the right skills. Uh, we, we don't have enough in our community. We're, we don't have enough nuclear safety people. We don't have enough quality people. We don't have enough future generation of uh, chemists, chemists and, uh, or uh, chemical engineers. That's what we need to be able to successful and uh, that's, that's part of reaching out to others. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, question there. Yeah, this is primarily for Gerald. Uh, one dimension I didn't hear talked about was uh, contracts that would be put in place to actually implement the technologies. And what I mean by that is you brought up Rocky Flats. And the key thing is there has to be an end user contractor with boots on the ground that makes it happen. And the one thing that seems to me to be important here is the contractor is going to make decisions on how many years they have to kind of pay back whatever investment they have to make, whether it's in an incremental change or whether it's in implementing a change in process. What are your thoughts on the trend that seems to be occurring of shortening contract length from five years or longer to three years or something like that? It, seems to me to be a disincentive for technology implement, implementation. Any thoughts you might have? Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> that the Rocky Flats model was uh, a pretty good model to use. The, 
contractor was incentivized in two or three ways, one of which was to use technologies. They had a champion there at the site that made sure that it was carried throughout the, the whole workforce, that it wasn't just somebody's idea and then they went away. The contractor is instrumental in making this happen. There's no question about it. You cannot drive this stuff down uh, because it, it just doesn't work that way. There, it has to be pulled in. So there needs to be a way to incentivize the contractor. We talked about this a lot in the, in the CF task force. I don't think anybody had a magic bullet. Rocky Flats seemed to be a good model that could probably be improved and modified upon. But the department is really going to have to decide what is the incentive within the contracts that are being put in place to allow the innovation that Kevin mentioned and to get back to the point of where we have been before, where innovation was really a major part of what we were doing. The length of contract is probably important. Probably needs to be studied. Can you really incentivize a contractor in three years in a big job like, you know, college boys? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's certainly something that needs to be looked at uh, and thought about because incentivizing the contractor to do a better job, use more innovation, use better technology is what's going to really make it happen if it happens at all. So you can't do it isolated. Um, the other thing that I think is and it's kind of related in a way, but I think the disconnect between uh, regulatory compliance and our ability to provide the budgets that are needed is an issue that's got to be looked at. Because right now, every penny in order to stay out of the courtroom has got to be spent to make sure you meet those milestones. So that means a partnership between the regulators and the department and the contractor needs to be relooked, I think, if you're going to have an effective, uh, effective contract that does incentivize innovation. Mark, you may have. So, so I agree, especially with Gerald's last point. I think it needs to be a partnership with the uh, regulators and the contractors because you got to kind of have that vision and foresight like we had at Savannah River that if it doesn't work, you're going to, you know, you know, you're going to have, you're going to try it, like with those groundwater um, remediations that were put in place. You know, you had a, uh, a regulator that was willing to try that out. And at that time, it was cutting edge, and it wasn't just pump and treat. You know, have a funnel kind of gate system that really is innovative in the, you know, in, across the country. And so... Just uh, one, one comment. Um, so we're, we're talking about creating an enabling environment, certainly in our management systems and the way we go about business. Uh, but to your point on, on contracts, uh, maybe we should step back for a moment, and I'll ask you folks, the contracting community, uh, does your contract structure allow you to think or work outside of the box? Uh, does, does performing exclusively against your performance measurement baseline create constraints for you? Does it, does it prevent you or preclude you from truly innovating? Um, in many respects, new technologies are considered high risk. Um, so how, how does that play into how you conduct your work and, and how you can help us innovate in executing our mission? So uh, the, the contract is, is a big feature in, in, in how we are able to, to drive the innovation, create that environment that will help us um, with your help uh, get through some of these tough challenges that, that we have certainly at our field offices. Uh, there was a question here? Yep. Yeah, it's related to what you said. Um, so, Kevin, on your grand challenge, I noticed the pie was broken up into labs and in in an Indian tribe, I believe. So, what if you were just a private industry that had a great idea that thinks has great application to a problem at an EM site but uh, where do you go? How do you get that to you? Do I have to go through a lab? Do I have to go through a CRADA, a PERDA, SBIR? What if I don't want to do any of all that stuff? I just want to show it to you at your Grand Challenge workshop. Is that even possible? Yeah, good question. Yes, it is. The way we've connected it is that uh, if you sponsor with or link to one of the organizations that either is one of our contractors 
one of the national labs, one of the six that have identified themselves to want to be bonded with us, or uh, a federal uh, person. And if you have no other way to get a partner in there, you send it to our chief technology officer or my chief engineer, who's running it this year, and she'll bond you up with the right agency or the right partner to go in to bring it in. Okay, but the top, the competition is stiff. And I'll add to that, certainly from the corporate standpoint, headquarters standpoint, um, that that's one of the drivers for establishing this radioactive test beds is, is providing the opportunity for those entrepreneurs, those those um, technologists who are having a hard time breaking in to our system, um, providing them the opportunity to demonstrate their their technologies. Of course, there'll be some some screening that has to go through, but but certainly in the context of establishing a radioactive test bed. Uh, to, to demonstrate and, and uh, introduce these new technologies, that that's part of uh, what, what Monica's um, initiative is, uh, certainly at the headquarters level. And, and much like what, um, what Kevin would do through the chief technical officer, we would do the same at headquarters and, and link them up with Savannah River, with um, uh, Hanford, with, with Oak Ridge, or, or wherever uh, the problem set uh, would, would, would be addressed. At I, I hate to, to cut off the discussion, but we need to, to head into the next uh, panel so we can thank our uh, wonderful technology development panel.